Hello and welcome to Illinois. Oh, oh, I said Illinois Gardener. Welcome to Mid American Gardener. We're glad that you have joined us. We are including the whole middle part of America because we're zone five. So we're going to look for questions from viewers and answer them in a timely fashion for what's going on right now. So we hope that you stay tuned. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois on the Urbana Champaign campus in the crop sciences department. So my areas will be cut flowers and landscaping with perennials. But there are three really talented folks with me Let's find out who they are and their expertise. And we're gonna start first with you, Ella Maxwell. Well, I'm a master gardener. I also <clears throat> work at a garden center and uh, my expertise is probably everyone else is at the table. So I'll just help answer some questions. And I did have a question from Catherine in Urbana. She wants to know if she can plant hostas and daffodils together. And of course the daffodils are now out in the marketplace as bulbs and um, uh, the hostas, you can buy them in containers. It's still easy to dig and divide them. Uh, so they can just be planted practically on top of each other and the daffodil foliage will come up through the hostas bloom. It'll be nice. So Catherine, you've got plenty to do this fall. <laughs> oh, that's what she wants to hear, but it is fun to plant bulbs. So that's really great. Thank you, Ella. And we're gonna go to our person in the middle, Kelly Alsip. Hi, my name is Kelly and I'm a horticulture educator. I serve Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties. So I'm near Ella. And uh, my expertise is greenhouse, uh, indoor plants. Um, I like insects, but I am with Phil today, so he will be covering the <laughs> insects. Uh, I'm just showing some pictures here from a, a garden that I started with uh, some 4-H'ers. We started a pollinator garden. We went to uh, the U of I and uh, researched uh, these pollinator pocket programs that Sandy Mason came up with. We planted a mix of flowering annuals and native perennials. And then we had uh, tons of butterflies. You see the before picture here. Uh, tons of butterflies and pollinators and we just had so many monarchs in the garden and everybody in the building was going out to count the monarchs and so we're just gonna go continue and there's the chrysalis right there we're gonna expand the garden a little bit next year plant some more annuals some more perennials and hope that we get to see the monarchs again and um all the kids will get excited over it. That was in a very warm, sunny spot. Oh, yeah. And then you filled it in much more than what Yes, it was. definitely. And uh, they just did really well this year. And uh, they actually had to go across a road to form some of their pupas, even though they did it on the sign. And I actually was thinking about maybe putting in an insect hotel or something, something sure. for them to form their chrysalis on. You put in an insect hotel to get over around with roaches. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's good to know. Roaches love hotels. I <laughs> oh, bed bugs. Oh. <laughs> bed bugs. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> but back to the monarchs. You I have said it first. Yes, you? I did, but I knew something was coming. So, But the monarchs this year have been going crazy at my garlic chives and on the sylphiums, the natives. So... It's a good year for monarchs, at least in my garden. I've never seen so many monarchs. And here, people were a little bit concerned, I guess, but I have Still never, Still ever are. seen so many monarchs as this year. That's I, good. Th that's uh, uh, the good, the, the rain, everything grew so lush True. this year. Even though we had a, a bunch of weeds to deal with, it was, yes, the plants we did. grew well. And maybe still do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you, Kelly. And we're gonna go next to our bug guy, Dr. Phil Nixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois, so I do bugs uh, and so on. And I'm gonna start out the show talking about boring insects. Some people say all of them are boring, <laughs> but if you remember back in 2012, we had a drought with a capital D. 
uh, very, very dry, and we are still losing trees associated with that. We expect to lose trees. Typically, we lose, lose trees for about six years after a major drought like that, so we're only about halfway there. So we're seeing a lot of trees go out. We had some cold winters afterwards and so on, and the point is, is we are seeing a lot of dieback and a lot of trees, and it's important to realize that sometimes you go out there and you look and you see borer holes in it, and you think, ah, the borer killed it. Uh, and uh, and really, it's it's the borers were coming in here secondarily. And I brought in this this branch that uh, that uh, was nice enough to fall out of the tree for me, so I didn't go, try to go up and cut it. But roundish holes like this, or or uh, or oval holes, are are indicative of what we call round-headed borers. Okay, and uh, and so the uh, and so these uh, these type of borers are typically secondary. There are some round-headed borers that will come in associated with that. And, uh, and the larvae are, are, are uh, roundish, uh, and the head is a little bit flattened, and so sometimes people will say, ah, it's a flat-headed borer. Well, round-headed borers have slightly flattened heads. It's kind of one of the understandings that you have to have of the trade. And so uh, these are really coming in after you already had a, uh, we, we need to get a little yeah, better let's background. Let's see if we can find something All right. behind it. There we go. There we go. And uh, here we are. Oh, yeah. And the, uh, and these are, these are going to be mostly secondary, coming in after the tree is already in bad shape and going downhill. And, but you can also get borers in just a dead branch on the tree or a stub of a branch, something like that. And they really won't attack the healthy live part of the tree. And so, you know, sometimes borers like emerald ash borer will kill a healthy tree, but most commonly borers come into trees that are already, as I like to say, got one foot in the grave and the other one on a banana peel, or one root in the grave and the other one on a banana <laughs> There you go. But at any rate, uh, I like to call them coffin carriers for trees. They may f speed up the, the, the death of a tree by a couple, three years, but it really doesn't do any good to try to spray and control a tree that is not coming back. You're wasting good money, and what I like to call that is prolonging the death of the tree. Let it go and start again, but realize we're losing a lot of trees due to the weather we've had, particularly in 2012, and then a couple years after that, we've had some other problems. Good point, because not everything is emerald ash borer mm -hmm. or really anything to do with the borer. And sometimes the bugs just come in to help clean up the endings, mm -hmm. not the cause. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Phil Nixon. I don't want to stop with Dr. Phil. No, better not. <laughs> okay. Well, we are going to go to your questions on the phone line. So we're going to start first with Susan's question on line three, and it's about morning glories. Hi, Susan. Hi, Diane. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I plant morning glories because I like to see the kids walking to school and looking at that big, beautiful blue display. It just seems like a happy way to start the day. Mm -hmm. But for two years now, I haven't had a single bloom. I get nice looking vines, but not a single bloom, and I just wonder what I'm doing wrong. Well, probably the first question I'd ask, do you ever fertilize these vines? Well, last year I did, and I got really lush foliage, and when there weren't any blooms, I thought, oh, I'll bet I did, I shouldn't have fertilized them. Uh, this year I didn't, and I okay. didn't get any blooms, so. Okay, so that was my first question. We're going to be investigative reporters, so does anyone else have a question? Enough sun? Yes, is there full sun enough for the... I, I think so. They certainly get full western sun, and I have had uh, really nice uh, displays of the heavenly blue uh, in years past, but something's going on. I'm going to throw it. Mine, ha mine I'm trying not to flower because they came up. But they have not flowered at all this year, and I haven't been that great of a weeder. I thought it was heat-related, but I don't know. But they have not flowered as much, and I don't want them to flower, and usually they do flower. So would anyone think heat would be a cause or the wet spring slowing them down? That, that, that's what I would have thought of, the slow. We haven't, you know, the, 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 some of the warm seasons really haven't had enough time. Mm -hmm. uh, my peppers didn't do very well this year because I didn't get them started fast enough. So it could be that because we really haven't, this is a very unique year with the very prolonged wet spring and then it was really hot. Did Susan grow them from seed or did she buy plants? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, no, I'm, I, I grew them from seed. I okay. 
soaked them overnight, and and they sprouted, you know, well within a few days, and took right off as vines. Okay. Oh, I guess you're you're gonna Susan, you're gonna change to scarlet runner bean. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I've never heard that. Yeah. How could they not bloom? Well, they haven't for me, and I was not wanting them to. So usually that's when they are lush and full. I've, I grew heavenly blue once, and now I'm. Wishing I had never done that. So I've seen it blooming this I year. I have seen some. So so we right now this is a mystery of why they did not flower. Probably because you want them is what I would say. Try something else and alternate them uh, with another vine next year and then come back to it. See if it does okay the next year. Susan, sorry we didn't give you a definitive answer, but we gave you some ideas. All right, let's go on to line four. And Dorothy has a question about daisies. Hi, Dorothy. Hi. Um, actually, what I have are purple cone flowers and some kind of black-eyed Susan type flowers, and I want them to self-sow, and I'm wondering what I should do to encourage that. Okay. Who wants to jump in on that one? Well, the, the cone flowers, if you leave the heads undisturbed, chances are the finch will eat a lot of the seeds out of it. So as soon as they've turned black, wouldn't you say you could actually physically um, kind of break them up and throw the seed around? And that Help way them. Get to the ground sooner, maybe mm -hmm. not get eaten. I have better self-sowing uh, luck with the black-eyed Susans that are the annuals, the Rudbeckia herta types, versus the perennial one, which is Rudbeckia fulgida goldsturm. Solovantii goldsturm. So I don't get the perennial one to self sow. It divides more. So try the annual one and it divides. I mean, it self sows beautifully. So that would be my hint on the black eyed Susans and that's your hint on the purple cone flower. But they will self sow, but the finches will beat yeah, you to that, it. That's why you leave them most of the time is, you know, for, for the wildlife. Right, so grab a few from yeah. them and give them the rest. So hopefully that'll get you some self-sewing next time for next year. All right, let's go to Rosalind's question on impatience on line five. Hi there. Hi, um, I plant impatience outside the front door every summer in a semi-shade where it's got enough sun for both of them. And suddenly in the last two weeks, they've been dying off as if we've had really hard frost at night. They now have no foliage on them and no flowers. The stalks are still upright. Um, they're getting enough water and sunlight. And I'm wondering if they have some kind of disease. They do. Did, yeah, did the foliage turn brown or blackish before it fell off? No, not that I noticed. It could have, I guess. But I've been away for a few days, and suddenly there are no leaves on them. It, with the exception of some that are growing under the, by the house uh, foundations, which are protected, um, and they're growing from the ground where I didn't plant them. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I asked about the, about the leaves is impatiens are tremendous slug fodder. And, um, and slugs can build up, particularly if you're mulching a lot around them and so on, and, and keep and the soil staying moist. You can build up, but we've had a disease problem on impatiens that uh, seems like it. Ella has a handle on that, maybe. Yeah, it's, it's downy mildew is a problem on the old-fashioned kind of impatience, and they used to be number one, but uh, this is a soil-borne disease, so you may not have success next year, but the hybridizers are out there and ready, and they have new, um, the new sun impatience that'll grow in sun or shade. They're the, um, the, the, they call them sun patients, and they've got uh, uh, all American winners. There were two this year that uh, are completely resistant to downy mildew. And Ella gave you a nice clue on how to avoid this next year. Being soil borne, they're likely to come back if you put your impatient in the same place every year. As a good rule of thumb to avoid diseases, you never put the same plant in the same place year after year after year. You're begging for disease problems, and insects will build up too. If you do have slugs, you uh, you move a plant, you, you space the plants out a little bit better, farther apart when you plant them next year. Maybe don't use so much mulch. That means you have to use a little more knee time with pulling weeds, mm -hmm. and you can use sluggo, which is an iron phosphate bait, if you want. But it's more likely to be a disease problem. 
So crop rotation works well for vegetables and for flowers. And mm -hmm. we've somewhat alluded to it with the morning glory question as well. Mm -hmm. So crop rotation, even though we're flower rotation, let's call it that. So thank you for that on the impatience. Now let's go to Richard's questions about surprise lilies, and this is line six. Hi, Richard. Hello. I saw where you have red surprise lilies and yellow ones, and before I buy any of them, I want to know if they'll grow in Springfield, Illinois. Those are amaryllis types, aren't they? Like chorus. Yeah. So. Kelly, you're shaking your head, so oh, I'm going to let well, you the answer. Pink, I've not seen the red or the yellow ones, but the pink ones grow in Illinois, and this is the perfect time of the year to start planting bulbs. I would research what zone it is uh, to make sure. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the yellow ones will because, you know, Dave Robson doesn't like pink. <laughs> so he has no pink surprise lilies, but he plants some of the he other colors. The yellow ones. I think he's done yellow successfully. I don't know about red. That one I would look up just to make sure. I, I haven't grown them, so, but, but do a little bit of research and don't go with one source, especially if it's just retail, go with uh, universities uh, and websites that have the zone that are not trying to sell you the plant. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Make sure it's right. it's back. And and Dave lives in Springfield, so he's been successful with yellow. Okay. So that was a good question. Thank you for that. Red and yellow surprise lilies. Well, let's do a tomato question on line seven. Hi, Martin. Hi. Uh, yes, I uh, have two raised beds. Uh, they're about uh, four by twenty-four. And I guess I've done the wrong thing. I've been putting my tomatoes on same place and uh, they this year it was a whole lot worse than other years they, about the time they started bearing then they just all died off I know I got the like the blight in the soil uh, but uh, so if I rotate that will that take care of that that normally does. I mean, uh, fusarium blight, if I'm not mistaken, will overwinter in the soil, and particularly if you're if you're not growing fusarium resistant hybrids, you're even more susceptible. To, even with those, you're you're more you're more susceptible. Um, I have a garden that I try to not plant the tomatoes in the same ground until it's been five or six years after I planted them there. So I'm moving them around. In fact, I move everything else compared to where I'm going to put my tomatoes. Never put them in the same place two years in a row. You're just begging for problems. And that's probably where a lot of your problems are coming from. I do the same thing. I just keep the tomatoes moving and the plant that I plant with it follows it. It moves around and I bet mine's a five or six year rotation. Do clean up your garden even if you are rotating. Make sure you get all the debris off. Cart it out of your garden. Don't compost it make sure that you get anything that's dropped out of the ground. The best tomatoes I had this year came up self-sown <laughs> in a partially shade part of my, my flower garden. I and must have thrown a, a, a tomato out there. And, and consider what family it's in. The uh, tomatoes are in the Solanaceae, the nightshade family, so they're related closely to peppers and eggplant, so you treat them all the same. And another set of plants that are very susceptible to some soil-borne diseases are, are your coal crops. And so cabbages, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, these sorts of things never put in the same, plate, same soil one year after another. So just well, do a little research and keep them moving. And, and Kelly did the straw bale gardening, and that could be something. Some people do have a very limited space, and they can't rotate. But maybe trying that straw bale gardening, I think, would, would work really well. Did it work for tomatoes? Oh, yes, it worked wonderfully. Um, and uh, um, I, I, we're all talking about tomato diseases, but I love it when people space out their tomatoes correctly. Oh, good! And Thanks for talking about that. And stake them, right. and then and, mulch them. and and I always, you know, pinch out some of those side branches just to keep good airflow. And then definitely, I'm a, a big fan of pinching off some of those lower leaves as soon as they start to have any symptoms. And uh, I think some of the newer tomato varieties mm -hmm. are just so much easier to grow without disease pressures. We love this tomato question. <laughs> There's really a lot to it. 
and you know a lot to keep in mind so and it's the number one plant people uh, grow for food is tomatoes it's always about and the tomatoes it is so it's good to be asking these questions now and then you can plan for it uh, for next year for spacing well we're gonna go back to um, the panelists and see what they have for their Second round. Ella, I'm going to go to you oh, next because you said right. some beautiful show and tell. I did. I did. I brought a basket full of flowers, and these are all cold tolerant uh, annuals that can be popped into your summer containers to take you down to about 40 degrees. So we've got in the middle pansies, the quintessential mum, sweet alyssum. We've got some chard and kale, dusty miller. Uh, dianthus, lots and lots of beautiful little flowers and you can see this bright color they're all new um, and fresh out there in the marketplace so if your plants are looking a little tired you can just take a knife cut out enough to pop a new one in that's what I brought it's so beautiful and it I do is. like the Swiss chard you can eat some of those are edible that's true and uh, well the other thing is is that you can just make a basket up none of these are planted they're just in individual pots and this would be a wonderful hostess gift or something for your front front uh, patio or front door it looks great thank you Ella very much and now Kelly uh, yes uh, I just planted some Swiss chard and some kale in my bales uh, two weeks ago so I could have something to eat and plus I wanted the beauty of them. They're, they are pretty. I love it when you have beautiful edible plants. Um, my question is about dividing flowers, um, dividing specifically daisies, black-eyed Susans, and cone flowers. And, um, you know, fall can be a really good time to uh, divide perennials, any kind, really. Um, and uh, just you, you my, uh, my uh, perennial teacher told me once that you could uh, divide uh, perennials anytime the ground was diggable. And so I've what done it. What a great suggestion. <laughs> I've done it in the spring, I've done it in the fall. You do it in the, you do it in the, the summer heat and then it has a little bit of uh, problems uh, being all stressed out. But now's a good time. Make sure you get a nice big root ball. Um, I love to cut back the foliage too. Uh, you know, cut back at least half of it and it won't have to sustain all that growth. But um, I might even wait a little bit longer until these flowers have, um, you know, turned brown. Mm -hmm. And enjoy the floral display before you divide them. Sounds good. Did so I do good? Sounds like you got an A in perennials, Kelly. <laughs> I think I did. A P in perennials. Oh, well. I think she got a good grade is what I meant to say because I was her teacher. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Now let's go to you, Phil. Uh, I have something that came up last week that I thought I'd kind of clear up before I got on to the email, and that is that there was a question about something on a red bud leaf, and uh, it turns out that was apparently a tree hopper, uh, sometimes called a thorn bug, and tree hoppers are sap feeding insects that normally don't cause any serious harm to trees and shrubs, and so they're kind of more of a uh, of a curiosity rather than anything which is really a problem. But the email I've got is uh, the viewer is asking what an insect is that's attacking their perennials and wanting to know if there's anything organic that they can use to get, get rid of that. Uh, and uh, the picture is what it was just sent in. Looks to me like it's probably flea beetle damage and flea beetles overwinter as adults and are around most of the summer and so they are there at any time in order to, uh, in order to attack the plants. Uh, they, are, uh, they can be controlled, uh, well the easiest way is just to ignore them because normally flea beetles don't do a lot of damage, they cause some, some foliar injury but nothing real serious. Uh, if you're looking for something that's organic to control them with, uh, spinosad which is sold as bullseye is uh, for home gardeners is uh, is particularly effective and it's a uh, it's actually the material coming from a fungus uh, and um, and for those gardeners out there who are not concerned that much that direction uh, 
carbaryl or seven or permethrin sold as eight insect spray will work well. Make sure whatever you put on, whether it's organic or not, you do not get it on the flop blossoms because organic insecticides kill many bees, just many of those kill bees just as well as, as chemical insecticides. So uh, realize that. Okay, very good. Well, we're gonna go next to the Mid-American Gardener quiz. What color of flowers do bees find most appealing? A, blue, B, purple, C, yellow, D, all of the above. D, all of the above. Bees are most attracted to blue, purple, and yellow flowers. Okay, before the end of the show, we're gonna have Kelly just briefly say, what is straw bale gardening? Uh, straw bale gardening is essentially growing vegetables in a compost pile. You take a couple of weeks to cure those straw bales with some fertilizer and water and the bacteria starts breaking down that straw into usable soil and then you can have fresh vegetables all year long without weeding okay, and no I'm gonna, diseases. I'm going to stop in there and say thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.